Welcome to class. Go ahead and take your books and go to page number 464. 464, let me move the mic away from my mouth. Uh, page number 464 in your books. I'm sorry today is a little bit later getting into uh, the lecture. I usually have my Monday lectures finished on Sundays and have them scheduled to be posted Monday morning. Uh, that did not happen last night. I apologize. Um, but, you know, you have a whole week to watch the the lecture. So, you know, you and in the meantime, you can just read it for yourself and then get the notes later on. So you should uh, find your place in Page, on page number 464. So we talked last week about the, um, we ended talking about the social changes that were coming in the Industrial Revolution. The social changes that took place was the rising of certain uh, beliefs in socialism. Uh, a guy by the name of Karl Marx uh, he came up with the socialist idea in his book, The Communist Ma Manif uh, Manifesto and Das Kapital. Those are his, uh, those are his, basically, that's his manifesto. Now, uh, I mentioned that I had a book on the shelf, uh, and I couldn't find it, but I finally did find it. It's called Marx and Satan. So I told you, talked to you about how Karl Marx started out um, at least having Christian leanings, and then something changed. We don't know what it changed, but then he became a hater, a hater of Christianity and the uh, effects of the Bible. And so you look at Marx's writings, and Marx's writings shows his change in temperament about biblical Christianity. Uh, I have it opened here, and I want you to listen to this. Again, he started out writing a book, or writing a, a paper for his college class, and the paper was titled, The Faithful Christ. Through the love of Christ, we turn our eyes at the same time towards our brethren, which were inwardly drawn with us to the cross of, to the cross of Christ. He knew how to be saved, but something happened. And look at some of the things he wrote that were very, very anti-biblical. Something changed. So, he said, again, Karl Marx said in, his, uh, in, his, in one of his poems, he said, quote, The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain, till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See the sword? The prince of darkness sold it to me. For me, he beats the time and gives the signs. Evermore, I boldly play the dance of death. So Marx is saying in his poem called The Player, he talks about him receiving uh, this sword from the Prince of Darkness and how he basically sold, again, the Prince of Darkness sold it to me. Well, what did he have to pay for this sword? Uh, to this, what did he have to pay the Prince of Darkness for the sword? Basically his soul. And then he says, after this Prince of Darkness sold him the sword, uh, the Prince of Darkness gives him the beats, the times, and the signs. And ever more boldly, I play the dance of death. That is a, an, a daunting, daunting poem. Later on, he said, uh, he said in another poem he wrote, listen to this. It is worth noting that eternity for devils means torment. Note Jesus is reproached by demons. Uh, in Matthew 8.29, uh Say, or the demons ask Jesus, Art thou not he hither to torment us before the time? Marx is similarly obsessed. Ha! Eternity. She is our eternal grief. An indescribable and immeasurable death. Vile artificial, artificiality conceived to scorn us. Ourselves being clockwork, blindly mechanical, made to be the full calendars of time and space. Having no purpose save to happen, to be ruined. So that there is, so that there shall be something to ruin. Ruined, ruined. My time has clean run out. The clock has stopped. The pygmy house has crumbled. Soon I shall embrace eternity to my breast, and soon I shall howl gigantic curses upon mankind. These poems that Marx writes, 
He's mocking eternity. He mocks the idea of heaven and hell. And again, one of the greatest, and I say greatest, one of the most glaring uh, examples of Mark's Satanism comes from a poem he wrote where he says, I wish to avenge myself against the one who reigns above. God has snatched from me my all in the cursed rack of destiny. And there is nothing left to me but vengeance. He wants to seek vengeance upon God. And he wrote this Communist Manifesto talking about socialism, talking about how uh, the only way for just social justice to take place is for the government to own the means of production in any nation. That's a dangerous thing. Because when the government says, we own your property, and we will dispense to you what we think you need, and to the other people, we will dispense to them what we think they need. This is a very, very dangerous uh, philosophy to hold to. In fact, let me look this up. I was reading earlier today, Jeremiah... Uh, where was it? It was... Okay, I don't have it now. I had it written down somewhere. But, um, in fact, I have it on my notepad here on my computer. Let me pull this up. Uh, so, with regards to socialism, socialism basically is the belief that the government owns the means of production and they will therefore dispense what they think is necessary to other people. So, in the Communist Manif Manifesto, Karl Marx talks about from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Meaning, I spent my entire life building a pencil company and I sell my pencils and I make hundreds of thousands of dollars from my pencils. Then, the government comes in because they own the means of production. The government owns the factory. I don't own the factory. The government owns the factory. And so the money that comes in from selling these pencils don't actually belong to me. It belongs to the government. And so the government can say, the government can say, okay, Mr. Seaford, you have hundreds of thousands in revenue from your pencil company, but John, right across the street, who chooses not to work, it's not that he has a physical disability and he cannot work, he chooses not to work. And because you have more money than him, we, the government, are going to take this money, because this money was never you to begin, yours to begin with, we're going to take this money and we're going to divide it up. You get half, and so does John. John gets half, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. They like to cloak it in the, in the uh, jacket of, well, not everybody has the same ability. Again, we're not talking about disability. We're not talking about someone who wants to work but can't work. We're talking about people who just choose not to work and blame society or blame this or that. And the government, according to the Commons Manifesto, is government's going to take the money that you earn and give it to that guy. Well, guess what? The Bible talks against this idea. Jeremiah 22, 13 says, Woe unto him that, built, that uh, buildeth, it's supposed to be buildeth, stupid autocorrect, uh, woe unto him that buildeth his chambers by wrong that seeth, again, autocorrect, that seeth his neighbor's service without wages. Or no, that selleth. Selleth his neighbor's services without wages, and giveth him not for his work. In Jeremiah twenty two thirteen, guess what? God is giving, uh, doling out punishments to the king of Judah, and he basically says to the king of Judah, you know what's going on? There are people that are performing services, and the government is coming in and taking that money and giving that to someone who did not work. Anybody says, well, the Bible doesn't talk uh, bad about socialism. It doesn't talk bad about socialism by name, because guess what? Socialism was around back then. But it certainly does uh, talk good about people getting what they earned. About me, who own that pencil company, that produced these pencils, and then, get, and then sell these pencils. I get to keep my wages. The workman is worthy of his hire, the Bible says. 
But it's important to realize Karl Marx, the guy that came up with this philosophy, was very anti-biblical. He says that religion was the final uh, cough of a decadent society, of a society that's dying. Religion is at the center of it. This is a horrible, horrible philosophy, Marxism, which is the founder of socialism as well. Every time you hear Bernie Sanders or Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, that's who you're talking about. People who love Marx's philosophies. Now, okay, at the end of this socialism, other changes began to happen in European society. So, let's take a look here, slideshow from current slide. Okay, uh, in the Industrial Revolution, there became a much more dedicated following to science. Now, let me put it this way. Science is, the name science comes from old words that literally means to know. So when you talk about science, it is precedented on the idea that you know what you're talking about. That's why the scientific method, you have to do experiments. You have to observe. You have to retest your theories. And once you can see a consistent pattern of these experiments working out in your favor, then you can publish uh, your findings as true to uh, the natural world. But the problem is, during this age of industrialism, there were, there were philosophies that came about that could not be proven. One of these scientific, quote-unquote, scientific uh, outlooks on European society that has yet to be proven was evolution. Evolution is touted as being, a, being the, scientific, uh, the scientific way now. Public schools are talking about evolutionary biology. According to evolution, pro propagated by this guy, Charles Darwin, in his book, The Origin of Species, he attempted to prove that organisms developed from simple to complex structures through natural causes. Let's break that down here. So, you realize how many bones you have in your body? Realize how many quarters of, how many quarts of blood is in your system? How many pints of blood is in your system? Can you imagine the intricacies of the human body? The fact that your body can, in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, your body can heal itself. You know, that is a marvel of nature. But according to evolution, the complex body structures that we have came about through natural causes. We all know that at the center of evolution is the Big Bang Theory. At the heart of evolution, they believe that millions upon billions of years ago, they keep changing, uh, there was a giant explosion. In evolutionary biology, in the theory of evolution, what happens is this. They believe millions and billions of years ago there was nothing. But even though there was nothing, there, were, there was what's called a singularity. A singularity is basically a small point in which all of the energy is concentrated. So all of the energy and all of this nothingness was all concentrated in this singularity. And then all of a sudden, this singularity, this energy, which by the way, if nothing exists, then where does the energy come from? That's a question I can't answer. But all of a sudden, there's this giant explosion because the singularity, where all of that energy has been put into, has been circulating real, real fast. And finally, there was an explosion and a chunk of something blew off of nothing, and that's the world we live on. Explosions don't create things. Explosions destroy things. Evolution, the Big Bang Theory, cannot, cannot explain uh, how an explosion creates things. I could walk into my front yard, create, uh, start a fire, but before I start a fire, I can, um, I can um, douse the firewood with lighter fluid. And up until I drop the match in the, uh, in the fire pit, there's, there is no fire. Nothing happens. But once that, the fumes of that, uh, of that lighter fluid ignite with the match, guess what? You've got a mini explosion. Never once, after I've done that, has there been sitting an Apple Watch in the fire. 
It didn't just suddenly create the stuff. They can't answer this. And, you know, it's interesting also, the whole idea with the Big Bang Theory, the idea that there was a lot of energy concentrated in one place, how does that make sense if there isn't a God? Because guess what? According to evolutionary, according to science, this is an evolution, this is proven fact, according to science, uh, energy is never created nor destroyed. Energy is never created nor destroyed. Now, what do we know about God? Take your Bibles and turn to John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, famous, famous chapter. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. That, that word, word, logos in the Greek, it is not just a written word. The word is capitalized. Why? Because it shows us something. John is referring to the Son portion of the Trinity. Trinity is never mentioned in the Bible. Trinity is never used. That word Trinity is never used. Godhead is used over and over again, but Trinity is not used. You go to 1 John 5, 7, which by the way, you know, what, what Bible translation you use at, at your home is your business. I'm certainly not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to beat you over the head with it. But other translations, oftentimes they try to remove 1 John 5, 7 from the Bible. They say there's not enough evidence for it, even though there is evidence. But if you look in other translations, 1 John 5, 7 is either not there at all, or it is in italics, meaning it shouldn't be there. 1 John 5, 7 says, in the beginning, or, <laughs> I'm getting confused. 1 John 5, 7 says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. The Word takes the place of the Son. So, in the beginning was the Word. Guess what? The Word exists. The Word has always existed. It has never been created nor destroyed. Now, can I explain how God has never been created or destroyed? Not exactly. Because in my mind, everything has a beginning and an end. But guess what? Energy has no creation, and it has no ending. Therefore, what exists that can create anything? Let's just say for the sake of argument, again, for the sake of argument, let's just say that the Big Bang Theory is true. That there is a sudden explosion, everything came out of nothing. Again, we are assuming for the sake of argument. That energy all still had to come from somewhere. Had to exist somewhere. Even if you accept the Big Bang Theory, guess what? There had to be energy. Energy just didn't exist from nowhere. I mean, again, it's never created nor destroyed. That's true. But you know what the Bible describes God as? As light, otherwise known as energy. Energy existed. Energy has always existed. It's never created nor destroyed. Guess what? God also has never been created nor destroyed. Are you detecting a pattern here? But anyway, getting off the gap, th uh, gap theory, getting off the Big Bang theory, and getting back to uh, Mr. Darwin himself. Now, Darwin didn't actually, as far as I'm concerned, did not come up with the Big Bang theory. Big Bang theory is relatively new, but the Big Bang theory has now been posited as a large part of evolutionary biology. Um, Anyway, Charles Darwin's uh, belief was that organisms develop from simple to complex structures through natural causes. According to Darwin, everybody ha every individual, every organism has a common ancestor. Now, in one sense, again, listen, in one sense, do not walk away from here saying that I said something I didn't say. In one sense, that is true. Because we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. In that sense, it's true. But that's not what Charles Darwin's talking about. What he is talking about is we all have a common ancestor, meaning we all went through an evolutionary process. We started out as a organism. That organism evolved. Uh, and as humans evolved, they got rid of non-essential quote-unquote, non-essential essential characteristic traits, culminating with humans being human beings. Them rising from, you know, frogs, from tadpoles, to frogs, to uh, apes, and then to men. Um, 
These are all things that they try to claim, that simple structures eventually evolved into complex structures through natural causes. Another thing that he believed is survival of the fittest, which is not, survival of the fittest is not exactly uh, heretical biblically, because many times the strongest do survive. But uh, survival of the fittest is basically the basis for his uh, belief that the weaker, not races, the weaker organisms eventually died off and allowed the more complex, uh, the more, uh, the strongest organisms to continue evolving. So, this theory posited by Charles Darwin, by the way, Charles Darwin, he went to school to be a minister. He went to school to be a pastor. Um, I'm pretty sure Charles Darwin knows better now. Um, but Charles Darwin, this created, and people say history doesn't have any effect in modern life. If Charles Darwin didn't exist, or at the very least, if he had stayed in ministry school like he should have, then guess what? Evolution probably would not be as it is today. Man always seeks a way to disregard God, so quite possibly he would it would have come about anyway, but through different um, vehicles. All right. So European outlooks in European cha uh, changes in European change uh, outlooks. Also, another uh, revolution in physical science was a guy by the name of John Dalton. John Dalton proposed that all chemical elements were composed of unique particles called atoms. So we are composed of smaller particles called atoms. Any chemical evident element, and while human body, the human body is basically, we have chemical elements in us. So, next you have Dmitri Mendeleev. Dmitri Mendeleev, he organized the chemical elements into a chart according to their atomic masses. You go into Mrs. Dye's arts classroom, or at least she used to. I'm pretty sure she do still does. In her classroom, she has the um, periodic table of elements on the wall. That was Dmitri Mendeleev. All right. Um, other revolutions in physical sciences. William Rowan, Rowan Jen, uh, Runtgen, sorry, Runtgen. William Runtgen, he discovered x-rays while working with vacuum tubes. You know what, we know what, two, what vacuums are. They're little devices that suck up the dirt off the floor. Well, when you, okay, let me put it this way. We're not talking about those type of vacuums. We're talking about this. Have you ever taken a cup, be it glass, be it plastic, whatever, and then have you ever just, you know, placed it on your arm and uh, when you pull it back off, there was a ring around your uh, arm. That's because there's negative pressure in that cup. The negative pressure has pulled your skin forward and created that ring around your arm. I remember there was a guy, uh, he was a, a grade higher than I was, although even though he was a grade higher than I was, he not all, let me put it this way, as far as upstairs was concerned, uh, his the lights were on, but nobody was at home. One night, now I remember because this was on a Monday morning, he came into school with his hand on his cheek, and he walked around all day with his hand on his cheek, and we're like, dude, what is wrong with you? And he said, nothing's wrong. We said, well, move your hand. He's like, no, I'm not going to move my hand. We finally forced him to take his ha uh, hand off of his face, and he had taken a vacuum suction, uh, like the, like the, the, t the uh, what's it called? the uh, hose on a vacuum cleaner, suck it to his face, and let the vacuum just suck. All that negative pressure suck, his, uh, suck, suck on his face, and it created a ring on his face. He went to bed, woke up, and it was still there. He had to come to school with a round circle on his face. Well, that's what we think of, of vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes are tubes in which negative pressure exists that creates a sucking motion. So by using these vacuum tubes, he discovered x-rays. Now, he called them x-rays because x, whenever you see x, that stands for unknown. So it's kind of like the unknown rays. He really didn't know what he was working with. All he knew is that these x-rays existed. 
Then Henry Mosley comes around, comes around later, and he uses x-rays to study more about atoms. We have x-rays now in how we can observe the human body. So this was a huge benefit during the Industrial Revolution. Now you also have Madame Curie. Madame Curie, otherwise known as Marie Curie, she discovered two new radioactive elements in uranium and then unfortunately died of cancer because that's what you do when you handle uranium. So she, I hope she enjoyed her two uh, Nobel Prizes in science. Anyway, um, it was actually a dual team, her and her husband, Pierre and Marie Curie. They discovered two new radioactive elements in uranium. Now, also in the evolution, revolution of the physical sciences, Albert Einstein, we all know him. Uh, he, was a, he showed the relationship between matter and energy. By the way, uh, interesting story about Albert Einstein. He, he once said, never commit to memory that which you can learn from a book. Meaning, if I can read about it, in a book I can grab off my bookshelf, then it's not worth remembering because I've got books that I can find that information in. And it takes me not too long to find them in those books. So what he did was, as intelligent as he was, the only things he committed to his memory was theoretical science. Meaning, that's stuff that you and I can't figure out ourselves without having to do math on paper. You know, energy equals mass. Uh, I can't remember what the C stands for. But, um... This is all theoretical science that really you have to commit to memory. Um, also interesting, he was granted American citizenship during the 40s while World War II was going on. Um, okay, now we're moving to the arts. So when it comes to arts, a new, uh, a new way of looking at the arts came about. It was called realism. So remember how I always talk about how history builds on itself. Well, not only does history build on itself, but history uh, also degrades itself. Let me put it this way. Every new generation, as you study history, you find every new generation rebels against the last generation. So it is man's nature to rebel against authority. That's part of the fall. Due to the fall, mankind naturally wants to buck against the previous generation. That's one reason why teenagers, uh, and by the way, I'm saying this as a, you know, someone who was, not a t was a teenager not too long ago, so, you know, I can say this, but teenagers typically, they rebel against their parents. They do things their parents tell them not to do. And that's because, you know, they want to end up rebelling against that authority. Well, history is the same way. History rebels against itself. Every new generation, there's something that's rebelling against the previous generation. For, in, for instance, you had the Protestant Reformation. Well, the Age of Enlightenment, in a large respect, not in every respect, but in large respects, revolted against the Protestant ideas. Then after the, idea, the, then after the uh, Age of Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, you had Romanticism. Romanticism rebelled against uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment. And now, after the Romantic Age, you have the Realist Age that rebelled against the uh, Romantic Age. Remember what Romanticism was. Uh, Romanticism was uh, basically a, a school of thought that was when you read, when you write, when you paint you picture several different things. You picture, for instance, the supernatural. You uh, exhibit thoughts of other places, other times. It's t they're uh, themes of the romantic, themes of the adventurous. Well, that's nice, but a lot of the adventure that we perceive wasn't actually realistic Adventures. There wasn't a whole lot of possibility for something to get, uh, something to happen. The Fall of the House of Usher. Uh, that was written by Edgar Allan Poe. The whole the house in the Fall of the House of Usher is tied to the twins in the story, 
And as the twins decay and die, so does the house. And then when both twins finally die, the house just seeps into the river and disappears from with no ruins. It's a picture of how family lines follow us. And because there were no children, these twins didn't give uh, birth to kids. The family line could not be uh, passed on and the house just kind of ceased to exist. That is an idea of kind of romanticism. It's it's supernatural. It's something that really can't happen, but it's interesting. Realism rejected romanticism because they believe that one must portray the world the way it should be. So rather than saying, okay, Mr. Poe, uh, I'm going to use, Mr. Poe says, I'm going to use this house to depict the fall of this house due to uh, they're not having heirs. The realist would say, what are you doing building a house that's just going to destroy itself when the, when the uh, family line dies away? Just say after they, the last two people die, there's nobody else to carry on the line. You know, don't no need to go and create the house as a supernatural uh, exoskeleton here. The realist would have uh, balked against the ideas of the Romantic Age. Now, as far as these trends in arts, you had people like Charles Dickens. Now, Charles Dickens was famous for writing uh, writing stories that kind of kind of express the views of the day. You know, so he's not writing like the romanticist. He's not writing about, here's ideology, here's what we need to do. No, he's saying, eh, here's a book I'm writing, this is the way things are. Not, let's see if we can change it. Let's, eh, this is the way things are. One of the examples was Hard Times. Hard Times was a book that he wrote uh, that basically... Um, he depicted living conditions in industrial cities by describing the imaginary city of Coketown. So while the city is fake, the uh, problems that are taking place, the industrial slums, the debtors' prisons, all of that's very accurate. Listen to this description that he wrote. It was a town of red brick, or brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of a natural red and black, like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys, out of which intermittable uh, serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever, and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal in it, and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye, and vast piles of buildings full of windows, where there was a rat and trembling all day long. So he is here describing the city, and this is a fictional story called Coketown, but anybody who's reading this is like, eh, kind of sounds like London to me. It's because he's portraying the city as the way it is. There's no, oh, the grandeur of the city, looming over this commoners as the great, rich, and powerful upper class stared down at me. No, he wasn't going to write that, because guess what? That wasn't the way it looked. It was an industrial city. Smoke and fog uh, permeated so much that the, the red brick now looked gray and gloomy. He was a realist. Also a Christmas Carol. Uh, we all know that. It's been, whether it's the Muppets Christmas Carol, I think it's still, uh, not Steve Carell. Who's the other one? I can't remember. But several years ago, they had kind of a cartoon uh, version of a Christmas Carol. He was depicting the way... Christmas for some people or some people, you know, Christmas doesn't have the same effect on everybody. This is all about depicting things the way they were supposed they really were. Now, other trends in the arts as far as poetry. Thomas Hardy. Um he liked when he uh when he wrote his books, he liked to portray man as engaged in a hopeless struggle against impersonal forces beyond his control. So basically, he liked to show his characters as fighting this invisible battle against luck, against, you know, whatever else. But he wanted to portray man fighting and hopeless in a struggle against whatever forces the reader kind of grabbed from it. A reader could read his stories and say, well, you know what, I think this person is engaged in a battle against luck. Or this person is engaged in a hopeless struggle against uh, bad living conditions, whatever else. That's what Thomas Hardy tried to uh, 
and focus on. Then you had Samuel Clemens, who was also known as Mark Twain in America. Mark Twain was a staunch atheist. But if you read Huckleberry Finn, uh, the story of Huckleberry Finn is of the titular character uh, basically running away and just l lazily floating down the river on a boat. Well, he, come, he comes across a black man. This black man had just escaped slavery, basically. And so now Huckleberry Finn is faced with the choice. Am I going to turn, the, uh, turn this black man in and let him be sent back to slavery? Or am I going to keep my mouth shut and let him make his way to freedom? And at the very end of the book, he makes his choice. Well, what choice did he make? Read it. You'll find out. Um, Samuel Clemens wrote Huckleberry Finn, based it off slavery. Again, this is realism, which is you can picture it as noble or whatever else you want to, ignoble or noble as you want, but this is uh, Samuel Clemens saying this is the way things are. And if first of all, if you picture slavery in a good light, you're sick. Um, Samuel Clemens was just like, hey, this is the way slavery is. Uh, also, Leo Tolstoy, Tolstoy, he was famous for realistically describing the life of Russia during the Napoleonic Wars. Then we get into the painting sphere. In the artistry, we're moving out of writing and into artistry. In this artistry came a new picture, a new type of painting called Impressionism. So in, impress, in, in Impressionism, uh, the painters wanted to make light and color their chief concerns and at, at the expense of clear outlines and portraits and paintings. Uh, look at page number 468. The two pictures on page number 468 are great, uh, are great examples of Impressionism. Now, a lot of times we'll think of Impressionism as you just gobbledygook. What do you see in this picture? Well, I see a, a cat riding a motorcycle, or I see a dog jumping on his owner's lap, you know, whatever else. Um, that's not what it is. You can tell what impressionist painting is, but the things is, the thing is about it, the outlines are very are very less defined. You look at these pictures, um, the painting about the uh, about the bridge. That you can tell surely that that's a bridge over a river, but if you look at it, you don't get a whole lot of specific details about the bridge, or the Boats. You don't see a name written on it. You don't see a captain's wheel. You don't do any. You don't see anything. You look at the picture of the woman and her escort. I don't know what it is. Um, they're walking, but you don't see the defined features of their faces. This is impressionism, and Claude Monet was one of the most famous impressionists of his day. Post impressionism uh, was basically a reliance on. Let's go back to the lines. Let's go back to the outlines. And let's not so use so vibrant colors. The guy on your right is Vincent Van Gogh. Now, Vincent Van Gogh, uh, when he was alive, no one really paid any attention to him. Uh, his paintings really got important um, after he died. And he died relatively young. He was a guy, he, he was a trouble man. He had a lot of problems. He spent time in an asylum, uh, a mental asylum. And if you look at his face, something doesn't look right. Why all of a sudden does his, is this, this random band of white going around his face? Well, that's because that was a self-portrait he painted. And that white thing across the side of his head is a bandage. Vincent Van Gogh, at one point, cut off his own ear. Now you see why he was in an asylum. He cut off his ear. Well, why did he cut off his own ear? No one knows for sure. A common belief is that he cut it off and gave it as a gift to a prostitute he knew and liked. Yes, you heard that correct. Correct. He was like, you know what? I really think you're swell. Here's my ear. Take my ear. Lend me your ear! I didn't mean literally. That is Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, he believed that, listen, I, he believed that he was going to make the lines very important. And by so making the lines important, he was going to uh, not focus so much on paintings. 
the self portrait or uh, of the color the portrait you see on your screen is a lot different from the pictures on page number 468 they're very different and his belief is known as post impressionism so it's after the age where impressionism was important okay that will be our lecture for today uh, go ahead and make sure you're doing your work I want you guys to know that I love you and I'm always praying for you.